Good morning, everyone. Hope that you're having a good morning. We will have some singing, and then our Lord's Supper, and then a lesson for this morning, and we hope that these all might be beneficial to you. We will begin our singing with O oh, for a Faith That Will Not Shrink, which is number 462 in your books if you'd like to follow along. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe, that will not murmur nor complain beneath the chastening rod, but in the hour of grief or pain, we'll lean upon its God. A faith that shines more bright and clear when tempests rage without, that when in danger knows no fear, in darkness feels no doubt. Lord, give us such a faith as this, and then whatever may come, we'll taste in here the hallowed bliss of an eternal Faith is the victory, number 134 in the books. Encamped along the hills of thy key, Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find, drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind, and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all good about, the earth shall tremble neath our tread, and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know, his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night. In Jesus' conquering name, faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world.
Let's have a word of prayer, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. We thank you for your son who rose from the dead on the first day of the week all these years ago. We thank you for that great, glorious resurrection and that hope that it gives us. We pray that you would bless us in this worship service. We pray that we might do things with a true heart and in truth from your word. We pray that we might be pleasing to you in this. And then strengthen ourselves through it to be pleasing to you every moment that we live. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Sing a Bible with me, number seven. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless. Oh, abide with me, swift to its close, ebbs of life's little day, earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away, change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. I need thy presence every passing hour. What but thy grace can foil the tempter's power? Who like thyself my guide and stay can be through cloud and sunshine. Oh, abide with me. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Hills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, oh, 
sing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence, which is number 299 in the songbooks, in preparation of our minds for the Lord's Supper. So if you have your emblems ready, we'll be offering a prayer for these, the bread after this song, and then proceed to the fruit of the vine. I stand amazed in the presence. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful, is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous is my Savior's love for me. In pity angels beheld him and came from the world of light to comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. How marvelous, how and my song shall ever be how marvelous is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows and made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary, and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, and my song shall ever be. is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, His face I at last shall see, T'will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Let's give thanks for the bread. Father in heaven, we're so very saddened that Christ had to go to the cross on our behalf. Yet we thank you that he did, for without that sacrifice, we wouldn't have any hope. Help us during this partaking of the bread to remember how badly his body was treated with the scourging and the crown of thorns and the piercing, the suffocation. We pray that you would help us to focus on that and in our hearts be thankful even while we're sad. Please bless this bread. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let's go ahead and give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of Jesus Christ, precious blood as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Thank you for his sinless life that was lived so that his blood could be shed on behalf of sinners like us. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to remember his sacrifice, his blood, his selflessness. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing one more song before the lesson, please. Walking alone at eve and viewing the skies afar, bidding the darkness come to welcome each silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in his power and might is showing his truth and love. Oh, for a home with God, a place in his courts to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. Sitting alone at eve and dreaming the hours away. Watching the shadows falling now at the close of day. God in his mercy comes with his word he is drawing near. Spreading his love and truth around me and everywhere. Oh, for a home with God, a place in his courts to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love, where I'll be pure and whole, and live with my God above. Closing my eyes at eve, and thinking of heaven's grace, longing to see my Lord, yes, meeting Him face to face, trusting Him as my all, wheresoever my footsteps roam. Pleading with him to guide me onto the Spirit's home. Oh, for a home with God, a place in his courts to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. If you would please take your Bibles and open them to Isaiah chapter 53. We'll be there some, particularly at the beginning and the end of the lesson. In the middle, we'll jump around a lot of different places. But if you would please, Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 10 is the verse that we'll read. I think you're well aware that this is a passage about the suffering servant of Christ, whom we just memorialized with the Lord's Supper. The thing about this passage is that it predicts very distinctly so many things that would happen to him and would be possible because of him, even though it was written 700 years before he ever came to earth. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10 is toward the close of that passage, which actually begins in Isaiah chapter, two, chapter 52 verse, verse 13. But Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 10 reads like this, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
last part of that verse we won't really discuss too much today. When he put him to death, when you put him to this suffering, when you put him to all of this as an offering for sin, what that's really going to do for the suffering servant is prolong his days because he will see his seed then. He'll see people come and obey him and be a part of him for eternity, as long as this earth stands at least, and then eternity with him in heaven. The first part of this verse is where we'll focus just to start this lesson, and that is that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. God the Father put the Son to grief. We know what grief is, I think, instinctively, intuitively. We don't really need a big, long dictionary definition of it. Grief is a deep sorrow experienced by someone or maybe a group of people over a particularly collective happening. Grief is a deep sorrow that weighs heavy on the heart, and it doesn't just go away in a moment or two. It's not the kind of sorrow that you have over frivolous things like a, uh, your particular football team losing or somebody in particular maybe just saying something a little bit mean to you. This is a deep sorrow, and there are many different causes for it. The question is, how do we handle it? Well, it's a psychological subject in that it goes to the mind. And the problem then is that I'm not a psychologist trained in counseling or anything like that. But it is also a spiritual subject. And the Bible speaks to all realms of mankind, physical, emotional, spiritual, psychological. And so all that I will try to do in about three or four lessons, two lessons today and then two lessons on January 17th, I hope, is to try and focus us where on what the Bible says about grief and see if we can gain anything that might help us to handle ourselves in times of grief. See what we can expect. Be prepared for it. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. Or, in retrospect, look at the things that we have that we might be grieving over already and see if there's any help there. I'm confident there will be. I've been taught all my life and know it to be true from study of the Bible that the Bible has answers to man's questions. Now, that's not to say there aren't other fields of study that are going to help, as long as they're in accord with the Bible, but the Bible does indeed have answers. First, when we think of the word grief, we probably think of, of death, of a loved one, but there are many other causes for grief as mentioned in the Bible. For example, the bad choices of loved ones cause us a whole lot of grief. In Genesis chapter 26, verses 34 and 35, you read about Esau, who was the twin brother of Jacob. Esau was the one who was the older and should have had the birthright and the blessing, but do you remember how Jacob finagled his way into receiving both of them? Well, that left Esau kind of bitter. One of the things that he might have done out of bitterness was marry the wrong kind of people. There was with Abraham and there was with Isaac, you remember, that desire to have marriages for their sons from their own people. That is not incestuous, but their own people that shared the same values, shared the same ideas. And it wasn't necessarily a racial thing. It was just that they didn't want people who were pagan, didn't want people who were worldly coming in and inflicting bad harm through their offspring by the influence they would have on them in marriage. Well, in Genesis 26, verses 34 and 35, the Bible says that when Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives, plural, and that was a bad thing to start with, it happened a lot in the Old Testament, and God tolerated it, but it wasn't ever God's design. He took as wives, plural, Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Basimath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. Now, you remember the Hittites were among the people in Canaan that would be run out some 400 years after this, by the Israelites. And the reasons that they would be run out, we discussed in a sermon not too long ago, they'd become horribly sinful. They'd become a place where the children had no opportunity to, to hope and thrive as normal human beings. And they were therefore kicked out of their land. Well, now at this time, the sin was pretty bad. We have indication of that in Genesis 15 verse 16, where God tells Abraham, you won't receive this land just yet because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It was bad, but it wasn't complete. Well, when Esau married these two Hittites instead of people from his own background, his own set of values, his own lineage, I suppose you could say, the Bible says they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. 
when loved ones make bad choices, it's a grief of mind to their family members. Proverbs 10 verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a grief to his mother. Likewise, Proverbs 17 verse 25, a foolish son is a grief to his father and bitterness to her who bore him. There have been lots of people who cried with me over the decisions that their children have made. Grief can come because of things other than death. Sometimes it's just a matter of the bad choices that loved ones make. And sometimes it's not blood family members, but spiritual family members that make the bad choices. In 1 Corinthians 5, there was that man in the church who was committing uh, immorality. And then in 2 Corinthians 2, I believe it's the same person to whom Paul is referring. And he's saying that person has repented. Nevertheless, he does say this in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 5. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. Well, Paul didn't want too much guilt laid on the man after what he did, but he did acknowledge that that man caused a lot of grief in the church when people fall away from the morals of the Lord and the spirituality that the Lord wants. He causes grief to his brethren and he causes grief to the elders. Remember Hebrews 13 verse 17? Obey those who have the rule over you and be submissive. Those are the elders. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. That means that the elders grieve over hard decisions that have to be made when people are sinning. Another reason for grief in the Bible are, 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 are things that never came, that you hoped to come but would never come. Now, Hannah in the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 1 would eventually have her longed for child, but there for a long time she was barren. You remember in the Bible story how she was praying silently, moving her lips, but no sound was coming out. Eli, the priest, thought she was drunk, and she replied in 1 Samuel 1 verse 16, Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. And then there's a very interesting passage in Jeremiah chapter 45, only five verses, it tells the story of Baruch. B-A-R-U-C-H, whom we believe accompanied Jeremiah to most places that he went and maybe even been, maybe even have been Jeremiah's amanuensis, which is a big fancy word for secretary. He took dictation from Jeremiah and wrote down the things that he said. Paul had those in the New Testament. Jeremiah may have had Baruch for that. It appears from these five verses that Baruch had some great ambition for himself, maybe he had trained himself to be a great scribe, great rabbi in Judah. But the trouble was the times were a changing and things weren't going to be such that he could be a rabbi. That job wasn't going to be there because Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. He prepared himself for a career that would have brought him some glamour and some recognition in that culture. And then it wasn't going to be. Listen to the way he's spoken to in Jeremiah chapter 45, starting in verse 3, you said, this is what God is saying to Baruch, you said, this is what Baruch said, woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I have fa fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. And then here's what God says, thus you shall say to him, God says to Jeremiah, here's what you tell Baruch, thus says the Lord, behold, what I have built, I will break down, and what I have planted, I will pluck up, that is this whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. He did not get to fulfill his ambitions because his society collapsed. He had dashed hopes. He had grief. Grief can also come because of enemies. Psalm 6 verse 7. My eye wastes away with grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. And in the New Testament context of persecution, the Apostle Peter writes in chapter 2 of his first letter, verse 19, For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Nobody likes to have enemies, but as Christians, we will have enemies, and it will cause us great grief.
Ironically, even knowing things causes us grief. Remember Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 18? For in much wisdom is grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. The more you know about the world, the more you know about the machinations of the business world, of the political world, the more you know about sometimes people, you know, sometimes you just get a little bit depressed about all the sin that's going on and about how things work and about how people are oppressed. The more you know, sometimes the more you grieve. It gives the opposite of that statement, that ignorance is bliss. I wouldn't want to go that far. I wouldn't want to encourage people to be ignorant. But we do need to realize that the more that we study the human condition, the more reason there is to have sorrow. And then, obviously, grief is experienced when people lose their health and when they lose their loved ones. The prime case of that in the Bible is, of course, Job, who in one day lost his stocks, literally, what would have been his portfolio at that time, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkey, and in the same day lost his children, seven daughters, and or seven sons and three daughters, and then a lot long after that lost his health to where he had so much pain with boils flaring up on him that he had to scrape them with broken pieces of pottery lost the loyalty of his wife when she told him to curse God and die. And then the Bible records that three of his very best friends came, made an appointment with him to sit with him and talk with him about his grief. But for seven days, they sat there astounded and didn't say a word. You've had an awkward silence before, probably. Maybe lasted a minute or two. Job's grief was so great that they couldn't say a word for seven days. That's what the Bible teaches. Job 2, verse 13, so they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Job explains that in his own words. In Job 6, verses 1 and 2, he pleads, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed, and my calamity laid with it on the scales. I wish there were a measure that I could tell somebody. And we try to get measures of pain, zero to 10. What's your pain level? Well, what's your grief level? That's what Job was saying. I wish there were a way to measure my grief so that people could know how grief stricken I really am. Abraham lost his wife, Sarah, in Genesis chapter 23. And he came to the area where she died to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Joseph lost his father, Jacob, along with the other leaders of the tribes of Israel. Well, Joseph would have sons that led the tribes of Israel, but Joseph lost his father, Jacob, in Genesis chapter 50. And you remember how all the family had gone down into Egypt to the land of Goshen some years before during a famine. Apparently, they gained quite a good reputation there for a while before another Pharaoh arose that didn't know Joseph and persecuted them in the book of Exodus. When Jacob died, Joseph commanded that he be embalmed, which was something that was reserved for special Egyptians. And then 40 days were required for someone who was embalmed in Egypt, 40 days of mourning, a month and 10 days of mourning. But the Egyptians mourned for him 70 days. And then also Esau, even as bad as he became, took time for mourning, took time for grieving. In Genesis chapter 27, verse 41, Esau hated Jacob because of what had happened with his father. And he said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand, and then I'll kill my brother. But he was going to take the time for grieving for his father. And then you remember when David sinned with Bathsheba and murdered her husband Uriah along with some collateral damage. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 26 and 27, the Bible says that when the wife of Uriah, that's Bathsheba, heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and, and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and there were going to be more consequences after that. 
For example, the child was going to die because it would cause great occasion for Israel's enemies, the Bible says. And when the child was born and then became ill, David grieved while the child was ill. 2 Samuel 12, verse 16, David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then when the child died, he seems to have come to a place of acceptance and got up and cleaned himself off and started eating. The people were amazed at that. And he reasoned with some good spiritual reasoning at that point. When the child was alive, for Samuel, 2 Samuel 16, 22, when the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who, who, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him but he shall not come to me, or not return to me. Grieving took place for public figures, Moses and Aaron, and then King Josiah was injured in battle in Second Chronicles chapter 35, verses 24 and 25 tell us what happened. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him to Jerusalem. So he died and was buried in one of the tombs of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. Jeremiah also lamented for Josiah. And to this day, all the singing men and singing women speak of Josiah and their lamentations. They made it a custom in Israel. And indeed, they are written in the laments. Well, I think we know how when there's a public figure that dies, and some people might have liked the public figure and his or her politics or business practices, and other people might not have, we still take time for mourning. We still lower the flag to half staff. And then spiritual people died. Prophets died. One particular prophet that comes to mind is that young prophet in Second Kings 13, or First Kings 13, rather, who went on a journey to speak the word of the Lord, but then disobeyed God and came back the same way and, and stopped and ate with somebody the way God had told him not to. And so a lion met him and killed him. And the lion stood by the corpse and the donkey stood there. The lion's not devouring either one to show that it's an act of God, of punishment for, for this man, because normally a lion would just keep devouring. But then the old prophet who had talked to him earlier took up the corpse of the man of God, verse 29 of 1 Kings 13, laid it on the donkey and brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. Well, there could be many other examples, but those will suffice for now. Let's make some observations from them. Grief comes to everybody who has any sense and has any mind. I don't mean any insult by that. I mean simply those whose minds are capable of ascertaining anything in an adult-like fashion is going to have grief. Grief comes to all, rich and poor, peasants and kings, the humble and the proud, the good and the evil, the servants of the devil and the servants of God, these, without partiality, are going to experience grief. Life can't all be a party, even though our entertainment-ridden culture may incline us to think that we ought to be laughing and jovial all the time. Life is not meant to be a party. Proverbs 14, verse 13 says, even... In laughter, the heart may sorrow, and the end of mirth may be grief. God, who made us in his image, made tear ducts for us. These tear ducts well up sometimes, I suppose, just for physical causes, but usually the physical things start happening because of the emotions within us. There's that connection that a lot of the world might not even realize exists. It, it, it tends to remind us that man is a dual creature made up of mind and body and not just body. These tear ducts well up when something has caused our emotions to well up. If it weren't for sorrow, we wouldn't know what joy is. If it weren't for pain, we wouldn't know what pleasure is. Grief comes to everybody. And the situations that cause grief that we've mentioned really run the gamut without going into each example again. Think of these situations. Grief was caused because somebody cared for somebody else. You see loved ones ruining their lives and you're helpless to solve. It causes grief. 
Grief was caused because anticipation, hopes were dashed. They never came to be. Grief was caused because people died. And people died for a multitude of reasons. Because of old age, they lived for full old age. And, and you're thankful for that, but you, you still are sorry to lose them. Grief came because people died prematurely. A child or someone in our day and age dies of an aneurysm or a disease way too young. People died in war, and they still die in war. People died of punishment. People were murdered. I remember a while back there was a member of the church, a young adult, who was murdered in a large city in our country. And her parents were quite, of course, grieved over the situation. They wrote about their experience of grief, how they went through different emotions that weren't always that rational, they would say later. But then they said they're just natural stages of grief. And one of those stages was to be pretty angry and even express anger toward God, they said. And they said one of their prayers went something like this. God, you don't know what it is to have a child murdered. Then about then they stopped themselves. God knows exactly what it is to have a child murdered. You had Jesus murdered on the cross. All of this might cause us to observe that grief comes to everybody. There's no temptation overtaking you except such as is common to man. Remember 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13? We usually focus on the latter part of the verse where God will not tempt us beyond what we're able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. Well, that's true. That needs focus. But it also helps to focus on that first part. I remember a preacher long ago not going through some trouble and I expressed my sympathy toward him and he said, oh, Andy, I'm not experiencing anything that is not common to man. Well, when we realize that, then maybe some of our anger can be mitigated. God is not singling us out by causing grief. I'm not the only one who's ever experienced grief. God is not angry with me for causing me grief. This is common to mankind. Because there's sin in the world, because there's death in the world, there's going to be grief in the world. And realizing that grief is common to man might also cause us to remember that second part of the verse, and that is that I can make it, that God will help me through it, that others have made it before me, perhaps others have made it in situations that seemed worse, although that's not to belittle what one person is enduring. Because if it causes grief, it's real and it needs dealt with. Hopefully we'll have some more to say about recovery in future lessons. Right now, please focus on what the worst possible grief is. The worst possible grief is over sin, sometimes the sins of others. Psalm 119, verse 136, the psalmist said, Rivers of water run down from my eyes because men do not keep your law. Are we spiritually sensitive enough that we cry sometimes when we hear of all the wickedness in the world? Jeremiah was. He said in Jeremiah 9 verse 1, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And Paul was grieved over those people who were sinning and would not come to Christ. He said in Romans chapter 9 verses 1 through 3, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying, my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have continual sorrow and grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. So we grieve that there's sin in the world because sin hurts people, even when we think it doesn't, it hurts people. And then grief comes when we realize our own sin. I think if I said the word or the name Ahab, you might think a couple of things off the top of your head. You might think of the name Jezebel, that was his wicked wife, that stirred him up to all kinds of wickedness. You might think of Naboth, whom he killed for his vineyard. But you might not think of the word repentance. But he did. After Elijah came to him, in 1 Kings chapter 21, and told him all that would happen to him because of his sin, particularly because of the killing of Naboth. He said, number one, where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, they're going to lick up your blood, Ahab. And number two, I'm going to cut off every male from you in Israel. That is, your dynasty is at an end. You're not going to have 
sons who reign as kings and grandsons and great-grandsons who reign as kings, your dynasty is at an end. And those consequences would come whether or not he would be forgiven of his sin. Those consequences were coming because sometimes sin has consequences even though we have spiritual forgiveness. Well, in 1 Kings 21, verse 27, the Bible records this about Ahab. So it was when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. He seemed to be genuinely sorry that he had given himself to such wickedness. Now, can you imagine? Let's offer a word of exhortation in a preemptive fashion. You're young. You haven't done that much wrong yet. I don't mean to minimize any sin, but you haven't done anything like to the degree and to the to the number of things that Ahab has done. Can you imagine getting to this point in your life where all you've done is wickedness? You've stood by your wife as she killed prophets of the Lord. You've stood by your wife as she sought after the wife of Elijah. You've stood after your wife as she had you build altars to Baal and altars to foreign gods. And you stood by your wife and did what she bidded when you wanted the next door neighbor's property. And you kill people. Then you finally realized your sin. Can you imagine the overwhelming grief that there would be? Preemptively, don't let that kind of grief come to you. Repent now of anything that you've done wrong and try to live life the very best that you can going forward. It will cause you a lot of joy and save you a lot of grief. Retrospectively, if you have come to the point that you've realized a lot of sin, you can still be forgiven. There still is an eternity. And while there may be consequences in this life, you can still go on and be with the Lord forever and ever. People grieve when they realize their private sins. People grieve when they realize the sins of a generation or two. In the book of Nehemiah, you read of people coming back from captivity. Why were they in captivity? Well, because their forefathers had sinned, so much that God had decided this nation needs to be done with. If it weren't for the Christ, I'd be done with them completely. So he sent them into captivity. Then after 70 years or more in Nehemiah's case, the promise was 70 years, but these people didn't come back till later. After they came back and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, finally, they're going to hear the words of the law. These people had been separated from the words of the law for a long time. God had said, if you don't listen to my law, I'll take it from you completely. People get sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that way. We ignore God's law and ignore God's law, and then finally it's gone. And they'd had it gone for a long time. And when they heard it read to them, they mourned. They wept. They cried out. Nehemiah 8 verse 9 records Nehemiah and Ezra and, and the Levites who are reading the law to all the people, and they're admonishing them, saying, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. We didn't keep these. And now we've suffered punishment. Now we're back, but we're weeping because we didn't keep these. Sometimes we people weep simply because there's a temporal punishment coming. In the book of Exodus, chapter 33, right after the incidents of the dancing and the partying at the bottom of Mount Sinai when Moses was getting the law, and God was so angry with the people, he said, now you go up and you take the land of milk and honey, but be careful. And, and I'm not going to go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way. He told them to remove their ornaments from their clothes, lest I come and consume you. And so they mourned greatly and removed the ornaments from their clothes. In Numbers chapter 14, when that next generation refused, or when that generation rather, refused to enter the land of Canaan for the first time, because they were too afraid and didn't think that God would provide for them. They got the news that they would not be allowed to enter the land of Canaan. And so the people mourned greatly. Numbers 14, verse 39. When God brings temporal grief, he can restore joy with his mercy. After the horrid destruction of Jerusalem, the book of Lamentations Chapter 3, verse 32 records this. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. The greatest grief to be avoided, though, is eternal grief. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, I believe, speaks of the second coming of Christ. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. 
Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. In other places in scripture, we have pictures of people who've already passed from this life into eternity who are mourning. They're grieving, number one, because things are so hot, they want one drop of water on their tongue. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Also, the rich man who is in torments mourns because he didn't live a better life to influence those people around him, particularly his brothers. That grief is still with that rich man some 2,000 years after Jesus spoke it. And it'll be with that rich man forever and ever and ever. It is inevitable that in this life we'll have temporal grief. And that temporal grief can be handled. We have examples in the scripture of people who handled it and went on. I hesitate to use the word overcame it because sometimes, in some sense, you never really do overcome. But you learn to live with it. And you might even learn to bless other people because of your grief. I can tell you about one who did. That's where we started. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Earlier in that chapter, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, the Bible says, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Verse four, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Christ came to bear the eternal grief. That's not to say he's suffering eternally, but it is to say we would all suffer eternally if it weren't for him. And so he suffered and he used that suffering of grief to help us out of what would be an eternal grief. We will have grief in this life, but we can look forward if we're faithful to Christ to a time that there won't be any grief, but God will wipe away every tear from every eye and there'll be no more sorrow, nor death, nor crying, nor pain, Revelation chapter 21. That's why Jesus invites, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Even if we suffer grief wrongfully for following Christ, his way is a whole lot less grief stricken than any other way we can find in this life. And so we would urge anyone who's not followed him to follow him. You start by confessing a faith in him as the resurrected son of God, and then being baptized for the remission of sin, being determined to repent, repent of your wrongs, and then be baptized for the remission of sins. And then you live faithfully to him. And you avoid some grief because of that. Not all grief, but you avoid some because of it. You might suffer some grief because of it. But you have the hope of an eternal place where there is no kind of such emotional suffering, but only praise and worship to God for all eternity. How that happens, I don't know exactly, but we're promised it happens. I don't know how God resurrected the dead either. Don't need to know, but I trust in his promises. If we can help you. I hope you'll reach out to us. Let's pray together, please. Father in heaven, we thank you. The tragic story is that your son had to be a man of grief and sorrows so that we could overcome grief and sorrows. We're thankful that it happened, even though we're saddened. We pray that we might be the kind of people that live in such a way that we don't bring him or you any more grief and sorrow over our sins. We pray that we can be the kind of people that bless others around us and let your light shine through us, that people might glorify you and more people would come to you. We pray that where we've brought grief to people, you might forgive us. We pray that where we're suffering grief because of inevitable circumstances or uncontrollable circumstances, that you would help us, that you would comfort us, and that we would trust you as the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we thank you for joining us this morning. Lord willing, I'll be here at five o'clock with another lesson from God's word, and we hope that you can join us that time.
Have a good afternoon.